All right, and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about performance in the 60s and 70s, and uh, when I titled this thing on my syllabus, I called it the New Shamans. There's this whole art form to giving things names or subtitles in art and art papers and academic papers. If you want to know more about that, just consult uh, my very famous uh, uh, paper, The Words Beneath, How to Create Interest in an Academic Paper with an Obscure Title and a Pedantic and Long Subtitle. It's a brilliant work. Anyhow, so, <laughs> and the reason we're doing that is because it, oh gosh, how do I explain this? Okay, I'm gonna go to C.S. Lewis. Uh, one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, writes a book called *The Screw Tape Letters*, and in the book *Screw Tape Letters*, uh, he talks to his nephew Wormwood, and he talks about how there's two ways to get people stuck in sin, and one way is to convince them that there's nothing supernatural in the universe so that they only see the world as a materialist thing and they don't have any kind of spiritual, uh, you know, kind of value to the world. But the problem with that is that you can't get them into the darker magics, things like black magic and Satanism, etc., because then they're very firmly in the, in the realm of, uh, you know, the non-supernatural. The other alternative is you get them deeply into the dark magics, the supernatural, the paranormal. But if you push them into that world where they're into black magic, yeah, they can do some really seriously evil stuff. But at the same time, there's always this escape route that, well, okay, you know, there's also a god. And so I can call out to that god. And he said, what we want to do is we want a worldview that has the materialism of the non-supernatural worldview, where there is no supernatural, but it has all the darkness and craziness of the magical worldview. And so we're trying, he, uh, Screwtape says, we're trying to invent the perfect combination of the two, uh, the materialist magician. And I wrote a conference paper a while back where I was talking about the influence of the occult on performance artists. Yeah, I know, this has got really weird. And I argue that the modern day performance artist is in fact the materialist magician. <laughs> that is, now I don't think they're evil. I don't get that wrong. I mean, it's, the analogy only works so far. But I make the argument that the performance artist doesn't make any claim to supernatural powers in any way. He doesn't claim to be a magician or a wizard. But they do almost exactly the same thing that a wizard or a shaman is supposed to do. They let you see the world in a new way. So the performance artists, particularly of the 60s and 70s, and the extremes that they went to, took on this role of the materialist magician. Someone who lets you see beyond the veil, like a supernatural, you know, kind of guide would, but doesn't make any claim to be a supernatural guide, lives fully in the materialist world. I thought it was a very clever paper. Uh, didn't get anywhere. Oh, well. Uh, it, went, it, went, it got very well received at the conference. It was hilarious. There were a lot of different papers at that conference. It was a conference at our own university, and uh, the, uh, the student uh, newspaper covered the conference, but if you'd have read the student newspaper report, you would have thought the conference was just my talk because all they talked about was my talk. So, uh, yeah, good press, good press. Uh, <laughs> you talk about the occult, you talk about crazy performance artists, that's great press. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because it deals so much with these ideas of spirituality in an age that's kind of lost spirituality. If you've listened to me in these long enough, you know that I accept a lot of Marxist kind of principles about these ideas of alienation from modern society which I think you ultimately have to credit to Marx and Hegel and etc. And performance art is a way of addressing that. So that's why on the syllabus, at least, I call these people the new shamans, because that's what they're there to do. Okay, I know this one's going to get really, really talky. This thing only has 33 slides, this presentation, but oh my gosh, I spent a lot of time talking. So, you know, put up some pretty pictures because we're going to stay on some slides here for a while. The thing that really brings this all into folks, focus is the Fluxus movement. And the Fluxus movement is, is really uh, the inspiration of George Machunas, uh, or Jurgis Machunas, 
who's, uh, I think, Lithuanian-born, but an American artist, immigrates to the United States, but then is active in Germany and elsewhere. And he founds this movement right at this critical time when pop art and conceptual art are taking off. Now, there had been some people who had been doing some very interesting performance at this time. You, of course, have theater piece number one by John Cage. You have some of Alan Capro's early happenings were happening before this. You, of course, have Yves Klein, who's part of the Nouveau Realism movement, who is doing his kind of anthropometries, etc. But those were just really the beginning. It's not until George Machunas comes along that we start to have this modern performance movement of the 60s where it gets really, really radical. And I, I do mean it's, it's radical. And radical in the sense that it takes performance to the extremes with the human body, but it also takes it to uh, you know, the extremes in terms of politics as well. So he gathered together a group of really in, incredible people. I mean, you can look down at the members, Alan Capro, John Cage, Yoko Ono, Joseph Boys, Nam Jun Pak, Carolee Schneeman, Yaoya Kusama. There's also Walter Di Maria and a dozen of others. These are going to be some of the most influential artists. Nam Jun Pak is going to be the grandfather of video and digital art. Carolee Schneeman is going to be one of these pioneers of feminist art. So everybody who came in and out of this circle uh, you know, took off with these ideas. But it's George, uh, it's Machunas that really kind of puts these ideas together. And of course, anytime you have an idea, you have a manifesto. So here's the manifesto. And he chose the manifesto, uh, took the word fluxus. And the manifesto is a mix of dictionary definitions. Those are the uh, blue or block text that you see there. Dictionary definitions of the word fluxus, and fluxus means flow, change, and that's what he was really trying to emphasize that. And between this, he puts these rather kind of angry statements uh, that say, purge the world of bourgeois sickness, purge the world of dead art, purge the world of Europeanism, uh, even though it's misspelled there. So, you know, promote non-art reality, fuse the cadres of cultural, social, and political revolutionary into a united front and action. Wow. So where is this coming from? Well, it's actually the artistic manifestation of critical theory. And so critical theory is all the rage now. Uh, critical race theory and other iterations of it ultimately go back to critical theory. And that ultimately goes back to the Frankfurt School. What is the Frankfurt School? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the Frankfurt School was a group of neo-Marxist scholars. Uh, it was known as the Institute for Social Research. And it was founded in, uh, I think, the Goethe, Goethe? Yeah, Goethe University in Frankfurt. And they were a group of social scientists, etc. And they were all neo-Marxists. And they had a problem. The problem was that in the wake of the Russian Revolution and a few other things and World War I, uh, there was a sensation that Marxism had gone astray. Marx predicted that the Marxist Revolution would happen in the industrialized nations of the West, England. Germany, etc., America, and it didn't. And the question then becomes, why didn't it? Why was it happening in remote, far-fung places that weren't industrialized like Russia? And so they started to come to uh, an agreement that the reason was the culture. So you have lots of different thinkers at this time. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, for example, spent the 20s in prison and wrote about this and said that the problem is, is the culture has kind of blinded people. Theodore Adorno was a member of the Frankfurt School, and he talked about this being the culture industry, that the culture created a worldview. And this worldview is what tricked people into thinking that, you know, they were fundamentally happy and okay with Western civilization and capitalism, when in reality it was, you know, oppressing them and keeping them down. Of course, it's a little bit condescending, basically is like saying, you know, gaslighting people and saying, hey, you know, you're, you don't really believe what you believe. You're being fooled or tricked. It's kind of my problem with that argument is there's literally no situation it couldn't be applied. You know, it's like somebody saying, you're a terrible husband, and you responding by saying, I'm not a terrible husband. You just have a false consciousness about how awesome I am. Uh, but at any rate, that was the feeling. That was the thinking. And so it was a shift in thinking that said that the revolution, uh, when it happens, has to come through the culture. And so critical theory 
which was really kind of, I think, formed first by Horkheimer and Marcuse, argued that you had to have a shift in thinking, and they opposed what they called traditional theory. Traditional theory they described as something that just sought to analyze or to explain things. But critical theory argued that, hey, scholars, individuals, we're not neutral. We make choices, even as consumers we make choices, and those choices advance some causes as opposed to other causes, which means that everything you do is kind of a political choice. You can't be neutral. And I actually think this is accurate. I think this is dead on. Uh, that, you know, if you look at the scholars of the past, you have, like, say, uh, Gibbons, uh, who writes The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, that is this eminent work. But that work went on to justify empire in the 19th century and really influenced a lot of people and probably caused a lot of pain in the expansion of imperialism and colonialism across the 19th and 20th century. So a scholar is not just a neutral player. He is actually an active player. He's not some referee on the sidelines, you know, calling, uh, you know, fouls or whatever. He is actually, I have no nothing about sports. Did I just reveal that? Yeah, it's like a referee in a ball game calling, you know, icing and fouls and, uh, you know, foul sh I have no idea. Sports ball! Yeah, so I just revealed myself as a total poser and phony. I know nothing about sports. But a scholars and anyone really in life is not neutral player. The choices you make matter. And so critical theory says you have to make choices in the advancement of of ideals. And of course, these were Marxists, so they had progressive ideals. And since they realize that the real battle is not happening, you know, in politics, it's happening in culture, they start advocating for these changes in culture, and they start advocating for people making these choices in culture as well. And this expands out to artists. And so artists kind of absorb this and take this on. And Machunis was probably one of the ones who was most adamant about this, about breaking down all of the social institutions in advance of social institutions that were more open, less European, less bourgeois, all of those things. And it was about not just making art, but about changing society. I think one of my favorite examples of this is uh, Ben Vautier, who was a French artist, uh, who created this, the Total Art Matchbox. Just read this. Uh, use these batches to destroy all art, museums, arts, libraries, uh, ready-mades, pop art, and as I, Ben, signed everything, work of art, burn anything, keep last match for this match. <laughs> wow! Okay, let's burn it all down, people. That was the attitude. The attitude was that all of these things, museums, institutions, needed change, and all of them were contrivances, and they all needed to be toppled. So it was, you know intentionally very very political and they f and if you go back to the original critical theorists you know Horkheimer, Marcuse, Adorno you know Adorno coined the term culture industry that they were going to tackle the culture industry the consumer corporate cons you know industry and take it over and give a new world a new way of seeing and they were going to break through this false consciousness and allow people to see you know behind the curtain and how they were being controlled by this consumer corporatist society and they were going to destroy the old things and rebuild uh, a new way and create this new world. And so the artists signed up for this. Uh, they And also the other thing that critical theory does is it brings Freudianism into it. It combines Freudianism because Freud was one of the first attempts to understand the human psyche. And so since the psyche is the, the heart of what human choice is all about and that impacts culture, it makes sense that you would fuse Marxism and Hegelian thought with, uh, you know, uh, Freud. So this is a huge revolution, and the Frankfurt School, of course, much like the artists, all became refugees. They all came to America. Uh, they wound up teaching in places like, I think Adorno taught at Berkeley, and USC and other places. Then they eventually went back, you know, after the war. But those seeds were planted, and so all of these, by the 1960s, these ideas finally found their moment in this art moment, and that's exactly what Fluxus was about. Uh, Machutis, for his uh, part, was had a kind of an experience in graphic design, and so hey, if you're gonna 
make an art movement, you gotta chart it out. So he makes this insane chart called Diagram of Historical Development of Fluxus and Other Four-Dimensional Oral, Optic, Olfactory, Epithelial, and Tactile Art Forms. Wow. Uh, that's just incredible. Uh, I know you can't see this, but if you look at just the beginning of it, you can see how far spread in the culture he is going. That he includes things like church procession and the Roman circus and medieval fairs, international exhibitions, all of these things. And then also goes down to Walt Disney. Walt Disney is included in this. Can you see this? There's Walt Disney right there. Walt Disney is spectacles and Versailles. This idea of spectacle. I mean, he says that everything is somehow art and we are to embrace that. Uh, you can see the other influences. And of course, it shows their influences. That they're really going to be influenced by futurists. Not surprising. The futurists were all about change, too. And he also is going to be looking at the Dadaists. And so a lot of the methods of Fluxus are going to be derived directly from the futurists and from the Dadaists. That's their chief inspiration. But I have to love that Byzantine iconoclasm gets a shout out because... I used to do Byzantine art. I used to study Byzantine art. It's like, yay! Even the iconoclasts from, from back in the 9th and 10th century deserve a shout-out. Those crazy uh, iconoclasts. John the Grammarian, who was whitewashing icons of Jesus. Yeah, you know, he's the, the cultural forebear of uh, these people. For those of you not familiar, the Byzantine iconoclasm is this violent period where there was a war in the Byzantine Empire over the nature of images and whether images should be allowed or not. And there were some that were iconoclasts who were about destroying images, and there were others, iconoduls or iconophiles, who wanted to save images. Now, the iconophiles and iconoduls won out, thank goodness, because I love art, and I don't like art being destroyed. But the fact that he includes iconoclasts in here shows his thinking. They're really about, you know, I was going to say, effing up the world. I have to edit it. I have to keep my wholesome reputation, although it's really hard in contemporary art to keep the holes in uh, reputation. You could, you could, you can't even see my picture, but I'm sure we talked about Andy Warhol's video uh, blow. You could see me blushing through the YouTube. <laughs> At any rate, their uh, their modus operandi here is really to, you know, f up stuff and and uh, and uh, you know break stuff and f up stuff. Oh my gosh. I'm such a coward. Let's move on. And what I love about this is you can see how he charts this, how intensely he does this. He starts holding the first uh, Fluxus Fairs uh, very early, 1961, 1962. And I know you can't see this, but you can find it online. You can see the density with which this is, uh, you know, charted out. And we're just talking about a few years here, you know, 1960s through the 1970s. And he is really responsible for bringing all of these people together. He really is. He is responsible for bringing so many of these characters together and allowing them a place to speak and to interact. And of course, that includes some pretty famous people. You should all recognize these people. This is Yoko Ono and this other guy who was, I think, famous for uh, inventing hipster glasses. He may have written a song or two. Uh, you may have heard of him. John Lennon? Never heard of him. Anyhow, uh, so, I mean, here they are standing on either side of one of these Fluxus works that was, in fact, uh, you know, Machunas' uh, work, which is this USA surpasses all genocide records. So when this one was, I think this was made 1966. And so you do have this intense political sense of it, and they really were committed to this. Uh, Machunas has a very difficult life. Uh, he actually ended up running from the law, and actually kind of turned his avoidance of the law into a kind of performance art, making secret passages into his room so that with blades the cops couldn't sneak in. It's really crazy stuff. Uh, he eventually got into debt to some very bad people who beat him up, and uh, he left New York. Uh, but he came back and, uh, you know, and, and did the Fluxus wedding where he, when he eventually got married, he died not long after this. But in this wedding, I love this wedding because this is one of the first demonstrations of attacking gender normity and heteronormity. Uh, he and his uh, bride-to-be actually, you know, halfway through the performance, got undressed and exchanged clothing. So he was dressed in the female clothing, she, you know, she was dressed in the male clothing. A way of, you know, disassembling ideas of 
the family, heteronormatively, gen heteronormity, uh, gender, etc. So, you know, I have students that think they're really edgy now, uh, but, you know, all of this has a long, long history uh, going back to the 60s and 70s. So this was, I mean, if you think this stuff is radical now, just think how radical it was seen as then. So we're going to talk about a few of these principal characters in the Fluxus movement, and then a few other people outside of the Fluxus movement, and what they contributed. If there is anyone that really lives up to the, uh, the title of the materialist magician or the new shaman, it would have to be uh, Joseph Beuys. Joseph Beuys is a German artist, and he was actually a member of the Wehrmacht, uh, the, the German army. He was not a Nazi, uh, but he was fighting on the side of the Nazis in World War II. And he was active from the 1950s to about 1985, when he uh, passed away. And he was an interesting character uh, because he is one of the few that actually, you know, pushed this idea of the artist as a shaman, as a guide to help people through other, uh, you know, ways of seeing. He himself said that everyone is an artist and we have to get used to everyone having that experience. And he tells a story that we call the Tartar narrative. Now, I don't know anyone who actually believes this story is true. <laughs> but that doesn't matter, because that's not the point. <laughs> what matters is a lot of these contemporary artists lie. It's so funny. I tell so many of these stories, and then I later find out, you know, well, that's kind of apocryphal, or I've, I've been told so many stories. And you go hunt these things down, and you realize, well, that was a story told 20 years after the fact, and etc. Uh, they were kind of performers, they were showmen, and they were challenging the whole notions of, of absolute truth, so why should we expect them to tell the truth? You know, they had embraced a, a world of artificiality, and they were tackling that, so there you go. But this is one of those ones that almost nobody believes this story that he tells, but the Tartar narrative is a story from his wartime experience that explains a lot of his motives and understanding of the world. So. Uh, he was a paratrooper. He actually lands uh, in what I think is modern-day Crimea. And this is a place that is known for being populated by Tartars. Tartars are these native peoples. Uh, they ride on horses. They wear a lot of felt. And according to the story, he was injured. And so they wrapped him in fat. Again, fat being a kind of source of life. And then wrapped him in layers of, of fat and felt and then buried him, and slowly, slowly nursed him back to health. And in this, he had a kind of spiritual experience and awakening. And then out of this, he came out a new person. Now, again, no one can actually confirm that this is a cultural practice amongst the Tartars, uh, and no one can confirm this actually happened. In fact, most people don't think it didn't happen. But he tells the story as a way of explaining how his art has this spiritual dimension how art is a spiritual experience. And a lot of his stuff emphasizes impermanence or the ephemeral nature of life, trying to experience things as, you know, the moment, as a kind of vision quest or spiritual quest. So not surprisingly, when we look at a lot of his works, they have fat in them. Uh, he, will, he will use fat and felt from this Tartar narrative as kind of metaphors. In this case, fat chair, he took a chair and into the chair, he placed an, uh, a large amount of fat shaped into a wedge. This was encased in a glass vitrine case uh, that had, was temperature controlled and monitored. And of course, fat degrades over time and slowly the most volatile parts of it, uh, you know, went away. And so if you go there today, you're not going to see this wedge. All the volatile parts have, you know, gone away and said you have this really crusty layer. So over the course of 20 years, this fat kind of disintegrated. Again, fat being a symbol of life, the fat sitting in the chair, that's terribly anthropomorphic. That indicates that he's talking about himself, the wasting away of life, etc. Uh, so right, right from the beginning, his stuff has this kind of sense of impermanence, this ephemeral character. But it's his performances that really kind of drag people's uh, attention. So what he does is he does this performance, and this is called Explaining Pictures to a Dead Hare. 
This was done at a uh, gallery, and in this gallery, he covered his face with honey. Again, honey being a symbol of life, vitality, also used in medicine and folk medicine. And then that is covered in gold. So again, almost like a Tutankhamun-like mask, preserving his face. This has been reenacted a few times, so you can imagine it looking a little better there. And so he covered his face in honey and gold, and then he cradled a dead hair, an actual dead hair. And he had a slab of iron tied to one foot, and he walked around the interior of this gallery explaining the pictures to the hair. Uh, sometimes he whispered to the hair, and he did so in a loving and a tender way, uh, as if trying to explain the pictures. And so there's a strange kind of performance as he goes around carrying this animal carcass, and then he would you know, he's got a, a, a he's got a slab of felt tied to one foot and a slab of iron tied to the other. So the felt dampens the one foot, but the iron magnifies the other footfall. Again, the use of felt. And there were other things, uh, a wilting fir tree, uh, you know, um, all of these things uh, were chosen for their symbolic content. And he would have been, you know, walk around the space, stepping over the wilting fir tree, this one iron foot and one felt foot, um, speaking things you could not even hear, as if whispering and then tenderly, you know, kind of taking care of this dead animal. So this has the, the sense, I mean, everything, the gold is about renewal, and the honey is about renewal, and life, and death, and the nature and the problem of death. And all of his artwork kind of emphasizes this. He would later go on to do a whole series of felt suits. The felt suits were, you know, sewn in a modern suit. So you have a modern kind of looking suit. But the felt is an ancient material. Again, a material associated with Tartars, a more native element, an indigenous element. And these suits he created in a series of a hundred of them, I believe. And then they would go into collections and he would say, I don't care how you hang them up. Nail it to the wall, throw it in a drawer, or put it on a hanger. Usually they're displayed on a hanger. But the idea was that, you know, the making of the suit, the suit and particularly the Western style of suit being this expression of identity in the Western world, but then making it of a material that is not used for a typical business suit to show that, you know, this is somehow wrong. This is different. So he's taking things like identity and deconstructing identity in this way this brings him perhaps to the most uh, famous uh, performance that he ever did in 1974. I, uh, oh, I, that's a wrong. It's I like America and America likes me. Oh, okay. Uh, it shouldn't be I love America and America loves me. That's an error on my part. Uh, but we also sometimes just commonly call this coyote. This is a, a really kind of interesting story we emphasize the moment that he spends locked up for three days with a coyote, but it actually is quite involved. Now, there's a video that walks you through this entire experience, but and I hope you go check out it. I'll link it down in the YouTube comments, uh, in the YouTube description, but I'll also put it up on Canvas so you can see it. In this performance, he flies to America on a plane, and he arranges to be picked up by an ambulance so that not once does his feet ever touch American soil. This happened uh, at a location where he was in an upper uh, you know, story. So then he is taken by the ambulance to this location. In the location, he is caged up with the coyote. The coyote is inherently an American animal. It has all these associations with shamanistic tradition, especially if you're familiar with the American Southwest. Coyote is a character out of uh, Southwest Native American mythology. Uh, that's often associated as a trickster, etc. But it probably represents a symbol of the United States itself. And he has large, par you know, sheets of felt that he wraps around himself. He has this cane. Now, this is a dangerous animal. Uh, I know people laugh at coyotes because they think about Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. <laughs> but the truth is, coyotes kill people all the time. Uh, there was this terrible case in gosh, Yellowstone, where a, a, a toddler many years back got yanked away from a family and killed by a coyote. So he was really genuinely putting himself in danger. And that's an amazing part about this performance is the absolute embrace of danger. 
And this is what performance artists do, is they break down these boundaries between the audience and the artwork and themselves and the artwork, using their own body as the object, and in so doing, really imperil their own lives and endanger themselves. So you may wonder, why on earth would, would you do this? <laughs> but if your goal is to deconstruct society, you have to take these risks. So he spends three days with this coyote and then is evacuated the same way that he came in, going out in an ambulance on a gurney, uh, taken to an airplane and leaving and never touching American soil. Almost everyone interprets this as this kind of commentary on the world of where America was. So 1974, we had just come out of the Vietnam War, we had just come out of the Watergate scandal. America is this imperial power. Europe is in the midst of the Cold War and feels protected by America, but that protection comes with certain strings attached. And so there is this tension that exists between the world and America that I think is a little easier for a German artist, particularly a German artist who came through World War II, fighting for the other side, to, to see and understand, to kind of compare to it. Uh, so it's a fascinating piece. And that brings us to Yoko Ono. And now I get to tell you about my personal experience with Yoko Ono. Yes, I have met Yoko Ono. I don't have many experiences with living contemporary artists, but when I do, I'd like to share those. Uh, and this actually is a personal rule in my life. I have a lot of personal rules. And I call this rule, appropriately, the Yoko Ono rule. Uh, <laughs> let me explain. So when I met Yoko Ono, uh, I was still a graduate student and I was studying medieval art. And I knew virtually nothing about contemporary art. In fact, I, I kind of hated it. I kind of thought it was a joke. And I've since changed my opinion and now I teach contemporary art. It's a lot of what I do. And at the time, I had an advisor, a graduate advisor, who was getting a Lifetime Achievement Award at a art association, a national art association, and she was being presented with an award. And there was another person who was there being presented with that same award. Uh, there was a number of them who were being presented the award, but one of them was Yoko Ono. So uh, I got to hang around kind of backstage while these presentations were going on. I got to you know hear Yoko Ono kind of give her address. And because Yoko Ono and this person that was my advisor uh, were both getting the same award, there was a kind of a little gathering there for them. And I got to go hang out with Yoko Ono for a few minutes. So Yoko Ono gave her talk and and I'll be perfectly honest with you. The only thing that I knew about Yoko Ono is that she was history's greatest monster. Uh, she screeched into microphones and she broke up the Beatles. That's what I knew about her. I didn't know diddly squat about her. I was pig ignorant on contemporary art at all. So I expected somebody to be ridiculous. I expected her to be, you know, this screeching prima donna. Uh, we have all these kind of ideas about what we imagine people to be like. And she wasn't like that at all. First of all, she gave a wonderful talk. Uh, it was pretty simple. Uh, some might say a little sentimental. Uh, but she talked about how art is fundamentally an act of giving. And so giving is at the root of love. And that, you know, you give of yourself to others. So art is an act of, of love. And I thought, you know, that that's, sounds like a greeting card, but it's actually pretty profound. And it was uh, a kind of an interesting talk. And then immediately after that, I... Well, there was a handful of us graduate students and uh, you know they got to act like you know groupies and fans and fanboys to Yoko Ono and I was kind of dragged along I didn't particularly have anything for her you know I was interested in her but I was there in the group so I got dragged along and I got introduced to her she introduced herself to us and she was absolutely lovely she's just an absolutely lovely person she we, we introduced ourselves and she remembered all of our names uh, you know and she actually, we, she was more interested in what we were doing as graduate students than what she was doing as this big star. And before I think some assistant that was with her, you know, kind of said, we got to go and, and wish her away. She actually asked us what we were doing in our research and seemed very interested in us and, and was very, very pleasant and said goodbye, remembered all our names. So maybe five minutes of interaction at most and she was gone. And so 
it changed my perspective on Yoko Ono because the only thing I'd ever heard about her is that she was this horrible screeching banshee and and harpy and that you know she broke up the Beatles which isn't true John Lennon broke up the Beatles he was on his way out long before you know Yoko Ono came along had problems with McCartney and others and and it changed my perspective and I said wow and so that's the Yoko Ono rule and the Yoko Ono rule simply stated is don't judge any person that you know through popular culture until you meet them in person don't if you know somebody I know you hear about this person is a terrible person this person is a horrible person don't judge any of those people until you meet them in person don't believe the negative things about them uh, give them a chance to to prove to you that they're you know great human beings and she was she was gracious uh, and uh, a, a you know a, a wonderful person to me and so that was actually one of my first introductions to contemporary art believe it or not I actually had to go okay, I have a complete misconception of who this woman was and I really owe it to myself to go find out more about her. So I did. And I went and found out more about her and she's since become uh, one of my favorite artists. So she too was active in the Fluxus movement. She has an interesting history. Uh, she is Japanese, uh, born in Japan, uh, but she was born to a wealthy family and her family got stationed uh, prior to World War II when she was a little girl in New York City. So she had a lot of experience with America. But then, of course, World War II happens. She goes back to uh, Japan. And actually, uh, for a time, I think she was she and her family were living out of a wheelbarrow. They were so poor. Uh, they went from being a wealthy family. And then remarkably, her family after the war uh, immigrated back to uh, New York State. And uh, she went through a variety of educational programs, uh, both in America and in Japan, and became interested in arts and started to create um, things and became part of this Fluxus movement. And she starts on a series of works that we call instruction pieces. Uh, and the instruction pieces are a, a set of, well, they're just simply instructions. They were just simple little things that advocated for somebody to do something without much specificity. There wasn't really any kind of other expression. There was this one, for example, which was voice piece for soprano. And the instructions are very simple. A scream against the wind, against the wall, against the sky. And that's it. And any person who took this instruction piece and performed it was performing a Yoko Ono piece. And so she would do this uh, with a microphone and a pair of, of loudspeakers. And she's since performed this many times. I've got a link, I'll put it into the description and also on Canvas, to uh, the video uh, where she reperformed this, I think, at the MoMA in 2010. And it's kind of hard to listen to i i will admit <laughs> it is it is a little bit hard on the eardrums but i think if you recognize this as a kind of spontaneous expression with these instruction pieces and she did a whole variety of these with these instruction pieces she was trying to create experiences she has a very famous quote where she says the world has enough things we don't need any more things and of course if you were an artist like a jackson pollock etc you were all about making things, making gigantic big monuments. But these were more about making experiences, things that you could walk away. And you can't say, no matter what you say about Yoko Ono, that she didn't create experiences. She continued to make these kind of instruction pieces, and uh, she did one with her husband at the time, Anthony Cox, uh, called Bag Piece. And I think this was done at the Sogatsu uh, Art Center in Tokyo in 1964. Bag piece was an interesting piece because it involved the audience and it involved two uh, performers. Uh, and first time it was performed with her and her husband at the time, Anthony Cox, who she later divorced when she married John Lennon. But uh, the two would get into a bag on stage. They would go into the bag fully dressed, then the bag would be zipped, and then in the bag they would undress. And then in the bag, they would do whatever activity they determined. It wasn't actually determined by her. And then they would redress and emerge out from the bag. So when you think about this, it's really interesting because these characters are naked. 
in your presence, but they are completely concealed. <laughs> the bag conceals their actions and their activities, and you get to see them in the kind of vaguest sense of the motions that they perform. It makes it very uncomfortable. It breaks these boundaries, again, of public space and private space, which was its intent. It is the next one she does, Cut Piece, which is probably her most famous piece, that comes off as not just one of the greatest performance pieces of all time, but probably one of the greatest uh, works of feminist art. Uh, the feminist movement was just starting at around this time, uh, so it, it really is a kind of remarkable piece. Yoko Ono would come out onto stage modestly dressed. There was a set of scissors there on the edge of the stage, and members of the audience were invited to come up and to cut off a piece of her clothing. Throughout this, she would remain completely impassive. She would not react emotionally in any way, and she would not change her position. And they do this until she is fundamentally naked. Uh, and what's interesting is if you watch this, and again, I got a short video of some of the clips of it. I'll include it in the description below, but I'll also put it on Canvas. When you look at this video, what's fascinating about it is that at first people are very nervous, this kind of nervous laughter, and they'll only cut small snippets. But as time goes on, they almost begin to feel ownership of her. You can see this woman being objectified as it unfolds until you have this guy with the ducktails, <laughs> this guy with the slick back ducktails. Uh, do you guys even know what ducktails are? Oh gosh. I know I can hear the okay boomer coming out. That was this way of you slick your hair back. You'd let your hair grow long on the slides, but you slick it back. So it looks like, yeah, whatever. Took a lot of product. Anyhow, so this guy with the ducktails, you'll notice him when you see the video, starts coming up and starts more aggressively cutting things off until she can't even maintain her modesty. At the end, the only concession she makes is she does move her hand across her breasts to maintain her modesty while she's being stripped down. So this has been interpreted on so many levels that you have the objectification of women. You have the artist becoming the object. You have a woman, you know, women are known for being known by their clothing and being objectified and turned this way. And as this went on, it takes on almost a carnival-like atmosphere. The people start laughing, it's funny, and you can see that they are losing her sense of identity as a real person. She actually uh, kind of described this in Buddhist terms, that the Buddha was this person who was wealthy and gave up all attachments. And so you can see her losing herself, her identity. But of course, we know that the Buddha lost his attachments, but became, um, you know, enlightened. So there's all of these things, uh, you know, packed into this. It's really one of the most exceptional works of performance art that's ever happened. From this, she kind of becomes a minor celebrity. She writes this book, Grapefruit, and in the book Grapefruit, this is the original publication, but here you can see the later publication in the back. Grapefruit is a hybrid citrus uh, that's a mix between, is it an orange and pomelo? I don't know, but she used it as a metaphor for her mixed identity. And it was this series of, again, of these instructions on how to create artwork. Um, she also started doing some more experimental things. Uh, she created this uh, affirmation painting where you couldn't see the painting until you got up on a ladder and looked up to the ceiling with a magnifying glass to see it says yes. <laughs> she also started doing some experimental films. One of her experimental films was known as film number four or bottoms where she filmed the bottoms of men and women, but at close up range so that all you can see is the butt crack. And her idea was being that, you know, looking at the extreme close up of a, of a, uh, uh, a human being that way, it becomes very hard to tell race, identity. It becomes very hard even to tell gender at times. And so these were ways of her of breaking down these distinctions and these ideas. It is at this time that she, unfortunately, uh, meets John Lennon. And I do mean unfortunately, uh, because her entire legacy has kind of been overshadowed uh, by her, in her, her relationship with John Lennon since that time. 
I've heard many different stories about this, and I honestly don't know which story is true. She was displaying things at galleries, and there was a... Uh, uh, and uh, According to one story, she put a green apple on a, on a pedestal so people could understand the actual green apple, and he picked it up and took a bite out of it. Uh, I've heard another story that that, nope, that's false. That didn't happen. The other story is that she had a famous piece, uh, an instruction piece about nailing uh, something with a hammer and that he saw the piece and actually wanted to nail it with a hammer and she refused. And then, you know, and then uh, somebody said, well, he's a millionaire. He's rich. He's famous. You know, maybe you could make some money out of this. And so she says, fine, I'll let you do it for a farthing. And at which point he said, okay, I'll imaginarily nail it for an imaginary farthing, all that, etc. Uh, but they became very close. And of course, they were right there in Machunas's group and were responsible with this mixed group. And it's through these connections that they come together. And Machunas was very influential in the, the, the bed-in. The bed-in was this thing where they decided to stay in bed for an entire month to protest the Vietnam conflict and to protest war. And so here you can see them together. But it actually um, makes me a little sad because, you know, almost always people immediately go to her connection with John Lennon before they actually talk about her work. She has gone on and made a whole, uh, a whole incredible uh, uh, series of works since then. Her wish trees and her foundation, which establishes wish trees, were these trees that people would tie their wishes onto tags onto the trees, and then all of those wishes become, uh, you know, kind of cataloged and preserved at a location in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, and that these are, you know, preserved for that reason. So I do think she's a, a very serious thinker and a very serious artist. We sometimes think of her more as a celebrity than an artist, but. That's too bad. Which brings us to Chris Burden. So Chris Burden is, again, one of these controversial figures in performance art of the time. Uh, active from about 1968 until his death in 2015, but the period that he did performance art was the 60s and the 70s. And a lot of his stuff deals, again, with suffering and pain. He got his BFA from uh, Pomona College in 1969, and his MFA from the University of California at Irvine. And his master's thesis, or, you know, was that he shut himself in his art locker for five days with a five gallon jug of water to, to feed him and a bucket below him to deal with, uh, you know, his waste. So he took on almost these ascetic, um, almost like a monk, ascetic, ascetic practices pushing his physical body to its limits. Here was a famous one in 1974 where he literally had himself nailed to a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, those were actual nails that went through his hands. Um, and he did a lot of these stunts to the point that people started calling him the evil Knievel of art, that he was pushing this to incredible limits. One of his pieces um, was he had himself placed under a glass case in a gallery with a hammer and a clock. And so he turned himself into the art object. And I love this piece because he had an internal rule for himself that he would not acknowledge anyone until they acknowledged him as a human being. And so he laid in this case for, I think, more than 12 hours, at which point um, a guard in the gallery brought over a pitcher of water and a glass of water and just set it there beside him that it you know everybody else came and looked at him and said oh look at this interesting piece of art totally objectifying him denying his humanity and then uh when this guard gave him a glass of water <laughs> saying this kid's got to be thirsty he got up and took the hammer and smashed the clock and that was the end of the piece the whole thing being that the audience itself was dictating the terms that could have happened within the first 30 minutes if somebody had just leaned over in the first you know minute or so and said hey are you okay <laughs> that would have ended the piece but it took such an amazingly long period of time uh it's really interesting of course the one that everybody remembers is shoot shoot happens in santa clara uh, this was an art space um, that he and uh, others had put together and he was you know it was the Vietnam War. People were being shot on television. 
live footage was being carried everywhere and partially under that inspiration but also partially under the idea of this person being objectified he decided he was going to uh, have himself shot there was a you know he realized that you know if I, I, I can't actually ask anyone who's a professional marksman <laughs> to shoot me but he knew someone who had been in the army who was an artist who was there who was a friend of his uh, to uh, to take the shot there was a small audience uh, they set it up and again I've included some videos uh, I'll include them in the in the YouTube description if you want them as well where he has himself shot now the goal was to just graze himself he didn't actually want the bullet to go through but he you know you're, you're standing about 15 feet away it's kind of hard to control so this guy who had been in the military had some training as a marksman shot him the bullet actually went in and out uh clean and the audience was there now the audience was kind of shocked because i don't know that anybody really thought he was going to do it and in fact uh, there are stories that you know this was part of the piece because he turned on the people and said you're all involved in this i just shot myself you know you're involved in in me causing physical you know, harm to myself and you know again that they were implicated in a crime and that's actually true that this is technically a crime this is a, i think it's a misdemeanor but it's the reckless discharge of a gun and if you were there witnessing a person intentionally uh discharging a gun recklessly then you're an accomplice to that crime so i mean he, he legally bound this small audience of people in this situation uh and and made it happen uh for his part he said it was like being hit by a, a car on the freeway you know it just clipped your arm like a mirror clipping your arm and and uh and he started to get a little shaky and so they decided what well, we got to take him to a, a doctor emergency room and they lied because they didn't want to admit that he got shot deliberately and so they said it was an accident uh they're all they were he he said he was convinced that the police thought that his girlfriend must his wife must have shot him and he didn't want to press charges but uh and but it passes into history as this first time where you really truly violate the person of the artist the body of the artist in such a way that had never been done before and this carries on to such a degree that it breaks all boundaries between the artist and the audience uh, and it nearly ended his career i mean you can think about this i mean how on earth do you go forward after this you know no gallery or space would basically agree to this because the insurance the liability must have been insane he had other plans and they all kind of fell through uh and so he winds up in the 1970s with nowhere to go he winds up in the 1970s with no place to go for his expression and uh he's kind of stuck and so he decides well how do i where, where do i go if i get if i don't have gallery space and I, I don't have other things what do i do and he noticed that there was a lot of late night television you guys don't know the joys of late night television of elvira and dr demento and the crazy things that used to get played on after midnight or after one or two in the morning all these old movies all these old horror movies etc i grew up on them i absolutely love them and then you know that was like the cheapest time you could buy ad time or air time on the television was those ads airing in between these b movies at two in the morning and he realized that's how i'm going to do it i'm going to get on the air by buying the ad time and so you know while people were watching the late night movie at you know one or two a.m uh and they were watching an ad for you know you know fred's appliances or mattress sale or whatever in the middle of this pops up this piece through the action uh, through the night softly where you see chris burden in his red underwear with his hands tied behind his back uh slithering on his belly crawling on his belly through a parking lot full of broken glass and these ads were just 15 seconds or so long you know just the shortest amount of time that he could afford and so you have these 15 second clips and it goes right from you know the movie to you know a mattress ad and then boom here's this guy crawling naked through a, you know, and then it goes to the next ad 
And it must have just been surreal on a level that you can't imagine. Somebody in Southern California watching this going, what the heck did I just see? And it was this sudden intrusion of this, this bizarre performance. And again, it was a way of reclaiming space that, you know, he says, I had no control over what was on the airlines, uh, the airwaves. So I had to take control and the way I could do it was sell it. So again, the subverting of, of, of the consumer world to actually make these messages. I've seriously thought about uh, doing a re-performance of this, uh, but I would have to call it uh, through my midlife crisis softly. Uh, it would be fun. I live right next to Jones Paint and Glass, and so I could pull up a dumpster of glass and spill it into a parking lot and just film this and put it up on YouTube, see what people would do. It would be hilarious. Uh, but again, it shows how... I mean, he really got cut on this. That's real blood that you see there. How visceral and powerful this had become. How we had kind of broken these boundaries. He ultimately decided he had to quit this, and he went on to go make large-scale sculptures and installations uh, he did a massive one called The City that has moving cars, like matchbox cars. If you've ever seen City Lights, City Lights, he gathered up all of the uh, abandoned uh, cast iron uh, street lamps from the first half of the 20th century. He found them all in like junkyards and he collected them and he put them as a massive installation in front of the L.A. County Museum of Art. It's one of the most Instagrammed places. So he continued to make uh, really kind of significant installations, but... He had to give the performances up. And then there were others that were really pushing boundaries and doing similar things. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about Vito Acconci. Vito Acconci was doing these pieces where he would really create these provocative performance pieces. This one was called Following Piece, where he would wait till somebody exited a particular location or gallery and then he would follow them and he would follow them at a distance and then the rules were that he would follow them until he couldn't follow anymore again talking about alienation in modern life how uh you were you know detached from someone he would never interact or talk to them and he would follow them sometimes for miles until they got to their destination or they went through a closed door that he couldn't follow them. So he turned stalking into a piece of performance art. Notice how all of these challenge boundaries of personal and private space. They challenge boundaries of identity. All of these things that these radicals of the Fluxus movement were trying to do. Now, Vito Acconci wasn't a member of the Fluxus movement, but clearly influenced by these ideas. Uh, trying to challenge these concepts. Uh, the more controversial one, I think, would be his seedbed, where he built a platform in a gallery with speakers attached to a microphone in the small crawl space underneath. And then in the small crawl space, he sexually pleasured himself, as the most delicate way I can say it. And then the sounds of this would be broadcast. Again, very similar to the bag piece by Yoko Ono you're next to someone just you know you're inches away from someone doing what is an intimate and private and often regarded as a shameful act but here again in this space totally destroying the boundaries of propriety of private and personal space and then there's uh marina abramovich marina abramovich is uh she's the one that i talked most about when i gave that paper about the influence of the occult on performance artists and she too really kind of pioneered this idea uh and she and her partner ule collaborated uh between about 1975 and 1987 but for her early life she was again doing these kind of ritual performances where she treated her body as an object and she deliberately put her body in peril. Uh, and she has come now to kind of frame this as the Abramovich method. Uh, Lady Gaga is one of her students for crime any sake. And the Abramovich method stresses, you know, meditation, ritual, performance. Uh, her process really does take on aspects of cult and ritual. Uh, religious performance. So she often deals with things that are about threat and death. 
and really seriously pushes it. This is one from 1980, used as an example, where uh, Ule uh, held a bow uh, against her, uh, you know, and she held the bow, and then they would have to hold this position for 20 minutes. Holding a bow, that's quite hard. Now, the bow didn't have, like, a broadhead arrow on it. <laughs> uh, if there's any you know, deer hunters out there, Utah is lousy with deer hunters who could tell me all the differences between the hunts. And So it's not like this would was life-threatening, but still, it's serious. You have this target head arrow on it. it. It could have done serious damage. And so he would hold this thing back, uh, and I think they would do it repeatedly. Uh, and so this is just, it shows literally the inherent tension in this. So she did a whole series of these called the Rhythm Series, and this is Rhythm Zero, which was done in 1974. It's more commonly known as 72 Objects, and it took place in Studio Mora in Naples. In this case, she again gave, much like Yoko Ono, the instructions to the audience on how they were supposed to behave. And she placed herself in the studio, and then on the table were 72 objects, and she gave the following um, instructions. I am the object. During this period, I take full responsibility. The range of objects was quite diverse. Wine bottle, fruit, grapes, flashlight, pills, hat, clothing, um, a loaf of bread, uh, a seemingly random uh, collection of objects. But included in this was one revolver and one bullet, as well as knives and chains and other things that could be physically damaging. And so for the duration of this, you know, nearly 12 hours, I will link to a video where she discusses this. She sat there impassively while people played with her like a dress-up doll. Uh, putting flowers on her and scratching her with the thorns of the roses, uh, taking pictures of her and forcing her to hold the pictures, uh, dressing her and undressing her, putting objects. At one point, someone actually did put the bullet in the gun, and that's when the gallery owner said, nope, we're done. <laughs> and he took the gun, and, and he didn't stop the performance, but he took the gun and, and, and got the gun out of there because he said, we're not doing this. Um, and she went through this, and it was not until the performance was finished, I think the performance lasted eight hours, it was not until the performance was finished that she allowed herself to be moved from this position and, and actually react. At which point she notes that the people acted in shock. They, they gasped in horror. In many ways because they had internalized her objectification, that they had seen her as a thing instead of a person. And suddenly she was a person again, and confronting them with the reality of how they had treated people. And so a lot of these artworks, you'll notice, deal with how modern life objectifies people. For Andy Warhol, the objectification was fun. It was, you know, let's have some fun let's turn myself into a brand name. I'll become a corporate brand like anything. And then he got shot by Valerie Solanus. And then suddenly that all came crashing. Remember the quote where he said, you know, I, I thought real life was real life and television was television. He says, now it's all television, that everything seems fake. This alienation of the modern world is what people were attacking at the time. And so I, I want to, you know, kind of close out with a couple more, uh, by individuals such as Hans Hock. Hans Hock a, was a German artist who really pushed this interaction with the audience to create the artwork. And he proposed an exhibit for the Museum of Modern Art where he said, I'll, do, I'll ask a poll question and people will have to answer the poll and there'll be two plexiglass boxes and they can put their poll answer in either one depending on what their answer is. And he did not let them know what the poll question was going to be. They accepted the proposal, assuming that the question would be something that didn't force them out of their comfort zone. And the day before, the question goes up. And the question was, would the fact that Governor Rockefeller was not has not denounced President Nixon's Indochina policy be a reason for you uh, 
for you not to vote for him in November? If yes, please cast your ballot, blah, blah, blah. Why is that significant? Because Nelson Rockefeller, in addition to being, uh, you know, governor, was also one of the richest people in New York and one of the uh, wealthiest patrons of the Museum of Modern Art. So this thing, you know, basically uh, caused an example of how the institution itself was tied up with the very wealthy and the rich and the powerful, and it forced them to acknowledge this uh, attachment. He was, you know, famous for doing uh, lots of this kind of things. This one was a, a another one called um, Shapolsky at All Manhattan Real Estate Holdings, a real-time social system as of May 1st. Uh, this one, he actually took legal documents documenting slumlords and the terrible rental practices that they were using and put them together. This actually ended in a lawsuit because of this, uh, because he was giving this information out. So... All of this, again, was a way of challenging the notions of the hierarchy and of deliberate institutional critique. This idea that our museums are not, again, neutral. That's pretty much the core belief of critical race theory. You are not neutral. You are part of this system that either objectifies people or doesn't objectify people supports the status quo or doesn't support the status quo and you can see this percolating today of course critical race theory moves into the works of say Imbram Kendi and others where anti-racism is you know a, a, a mark of this kind of institutional critique that we have these discussions about white privilege etc that you it is not enough to be neutral you can't say that you are not racist you either have to be actively racist or actively anti-racist, at least in the proposition of Imbram Kendi and in this theory. So hopefully this gives you a sense, I mean, I think this is very, very relevant even today, of, of how these artists were, again, very much like materialist magicians. They were trying to give us supernatural insights, feelings of spirituality, feelings beyond the curtain, breaking us outside of these structural or institutional norms that the world had created as a critique against the kind of corporate and consumerist world. But hey, we fixed all those problems and don't have to worry about that. So just enjoy your iPhones and uh, Facebook. Okay. All right, that's a good place to fix it. That's a good place to end it. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>